Welcome to our last session of the day. Our, we have two speakers in this session. Uh, our third speaker is uh, moved to uh, a future slot in uh, Christos Papadimitriou's slot because he won't be able to make it. So, um, so Tim Roughgarden will be speaking later. Um, in this session, we have, uh, first of all, Ishai Mansour speaking about welfare and profit maximization with production costs. Thank you very much. This is a joint work with Avram Blam and from Gupta in Ankit Sharma. Okay, so, so basically the title of the talk is long, but it says more or less the entire, the entire subject of what I'm going to talk about. If you remember the title, it's good enough for me. So for those who still want to stay, <laughs> let's <laughs> to back up. Did you get it? Okay. It's going to be on the web later. <laughs> okay, so the model that I'm going to talk about is sort of, he, the main focus would be the production cost. So the main thing that I'm going to look at is how is the production cost is changing. So I did look at the case where the production cost is increasing when, you're, when you have more and more items. On the, on the left hand side is sort of the, the details of the model and the next slide I'll sort of do a more visual way of talking about the model. So we'll have multiple buyers. The buyer would have an arbitrary evaluation over subsets. There was going to be multiple product. And the mechanism that I'm going to talk about is sort of setting prices. So buyer would come, they would see a set of prices, they would buy a bundle, and then afterwards the seller would, would have a chance to reestablish the prices. It's going to be an online setting in which we don't know which which customers are buying. We don't have a prior distribution about what the valuation is. And the two goals that we are going to look at, the main one is that we look at is maximizing welfare. And I'm going to talk also on how to convert sort of a maximizing welfare algorithm to a maximizing profit algorithm. So this is in essence the model, and here's a more visual way of seeing the model. So really we sort of we have a bunch of products. So you can see here you're going to the grocery and you have this bunch of products. The first thing that the seller needs to do is sort of to, to set prices. So in this case, sort of the prices are set in shekels and not in dollars, but every item now has a price. And the next thing is sort of a buyer comes in and given the price and his utility, he's going to buy a bundle. So now given those prices, he selects a bundle and this is sort of what we assume is, of course, the bundle that is sort of maximizing its surplus. The surplus would be the difference between the, pay the payment that he's going to, to pay versus the utility that, that he's going to get from this bundle. What? Indivisible. Yeah. Right. I get this. this the sausage was should have selected something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, from the one hand side, we are going to get the social welfare from this buyer. So the social welfare would be the difference between his valuation for the, for the bundle that he took, minus the cost the, that it co cost us to produce the thing. On the other hand, the seller is going to, to, to get a profit. Now, after the first buyer comes and goes, you can think that the next step that the seller does is sort of he can erase the entire prices. What really happens in our setting is that now sort of certain item he sold, he sold bread, cheese, and a cola. Those items, since we're assuming that in increasing marginal cost of production, their cost is going up. And now the seller has to set up new prices. He can set up any prices that he likes, although the natural thing is to assume that the items whose production price is going up should naturally sort of the prices we should expect also to go up on those prices. And now we sort of continue with the next buy. So the next buy comes, takes a bundle, the items that you see select, their marginal cost is going up, and then the seller sets, sets again new prices. So this is sort of the model that I'm going to talk about. So the main th twist or the main difference between this sort of and other works in computer science is looking at the production cost, which is increasing with a number of items. If you look at the CS literature, really there is sort of a dichotomy. There is two sets of different ways of viewing the production cost, although it's never stated in this way. 
The digital good literature on the unlimited supply really assume a fixed production cost. In some sense, you assume that the production cost could be zero, like in the previous talk, or it could be, let's say, a t-shirt cost one dollar of production, it's regardless of whether you produce one or a million. This is sort of one extreme model. The other extreme model is a limited supply. In a limited supply case, you, you really have a fixed cost of production up to some point, and then it goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. So those are the, probably for most of you are aware, of, those are the two popular models that, at least in the algorithmic game lit theory literature, people have studied. In some sense, those are very two extreme cases. And what we'd like to do is sort of, in, in some sense, look at something in between those two extreme cases. And the economics literature, the basic economics literature, is, has a different sort of marginal cost in mind. So for a large, OK, so if you think what is the basic sort of supply and demand curve look like? So the demand is sort of downward sloping as prices going up. Makes sense. Because it's really saying that as you are pushing the price upward, people are going to buy less. The supply side, we all sort of saw this picture, never, maybe didn't ask enough question why. So the supply side is usually going up. Going up is like a norm stock. It's really assuming a convex economy. And, it's, and in some sense, it doesn't assume a benefit of a scale. In this talk, we'll, we'll, we'll be basically be looking at this assumption, right? This is really assuming that the marginal cost, that the cost of items is really going up as I'm selling more and more items. So this talk would be in line with the basic sort of economic literature. So just to summarize, what are you going to, to see in this talk? So what's going to be the basic model? So the basic thing is I'm going to talk about production cost, and production cost is going to increase. It might be increasing differently for different items, but it's definitely not going to decrease when I'm selling more items. So I'm not, right, so I'm ruling out the benefit of mass production. The mechanism that I'm going to use is posted prices, sort of. So for those of you who are more familiar with combinatorial auctions, just remember that in some sense, posting a price is always sort of it's a truth tool. If you like it to think of it as a, as a mechanism, it's always truth tool because a person comes, sees the prices, and he can do whatever he likes. I would also claim that it's more realistic when you look at the real economy. Posted prices are the main venue in which people do sell and buy things today. So I think it's, I, I always feel awkward that I need to defend a model of posted prices. <laughs> okay, and, and the setting is going to be an online setting in which people would come in, buy a bundle. We don't have a prior knowledge about what they want. We don't have a prior knowledge sort of how their utility function is looking like. What we do get in retrospect, we do see sort of the bundles that they bought given the prices that we offered. But we don't have any a priori knowledge about this. So here's sort of a short summary of our result. The, the first two results, this is the first result, is about welfare maximization. And just sort of uh, to be clear, the social welfare is defined here as the sum of the values of utilities of the buyer minus the cost of producing them, right? So usually we don't subtract the cost because we are thinking of cost as constant. Here it makes a lot of sense to subtract it, right? Because otherwise if we are not going to subtract the cost, we sort of will be giving out items at, to people who value them less than the cost of producing them. So this is a, the natural way of defining the social cost. So the first is going to be a very simple mechanism or algorithm that basically would price the, the kth copy of an item by the cost of the two kth copies of the same item. Right. So it's clear that it's simple. At this point, it shouldn't be clear at all why, is it, why does, does it make any interesting claims. But what we are able to show that in many interesting cases, 
For this simple algorithm, we can show a constant competitive ratio. For, so for example, when the production cost increases linearly, so the kth copy is, is sort of a linear function of k, or the kth copy is a polynomial function of k, or the kth copy is a logarithmic function of k. In all those cases, we can show a constant competitive ratio. This is sort of in constant with the usual sort of logarithmic competitive ratio that we have sort of for more general combinatorial cases. This is a very nice algorithm, but it will sort of fail for a limited supply. When I probably later in the talk, we'll be able to show this, this simple example. For, the, for a more general case of a convex production cost of which is increasing, we can get we can get a logarithmic competitive ratio. This is sort of more complex than just limited supply, but it does have limited, handles the limited supply, and it sort of uses also the ideas of uh, Bartal, Gonen, and Nissan in their work on online uh, pricing in the case of limited supply. For the profit maximization, Right, so, so what is the profit? The profit would be the difference, of course, between the revenue that we get for selling the items minus the cost. So here it's clear why we're subtracting the cost. So what we'll be able to show, we'll be able to show a logarithmic competitive ratio in this case. And we really, we, what we are showing is a sort of a generic result. The generic result would say that if you have a good social welfare algorithm, so basically, if you give me two black boxes, one black box, can guarantee a high social welfare then there are multiple buyers. The other black box is just, just knows how to help a single buyer but extract from him a, a high profit. We can combine those two and get a profit maximization algorithm. It's sort of the competitive ratios will multiply when we get to it. This is a very, a, a very similar result in the same spirit is due to to Avr, Buchazar, and Meyerson. Okay. So, so rather than trying to, to show the result by myself, what I want first to show is sort of a technical lemma or a structural theorem, which based on it, so sort of I think sort of would, the other results would be sort of obvious and therefore I'm not going to prove any of them. So, so the main thing is that let's, fix one pro product and fix the pricing scheme. So if you fix the product, this is its cost curve. So the cost curve is going up as more and more items are getting sold. And you fix the pricing uh, scheme. I'm also sort of, for this slide, I'm assuming that the prices are going up. Later, all my, my pricing scheme will have this sort of this property. So now, when we finish the sort of seeing all the buyers, we've sold a certain amount of items. This is this line is sort of the threshold of how many items did we sell. So now the, our, visually our profit is really this brown area. So this is the differences between the prices that the buyer pay and the cost that we incurred in producing those items. So this area is, is really the online algorithm's profit, given the curve that is sort of the prices curve that is used. Now, in, in some sense, the prices that it will be offering to new buyers is not a, is not, well, let's see if I can see it from here. It's not this price, but it's one item above. It's an indivisible good, as Silvio pointed out. Indivisible good sort of, it's going to jump by one every time. So the real thing is that what can sort of an adversary or what the best thing that we can hope, what I need to convince you is sort of the best thing that an optimal algorithm can do is get all this below area. So in some sense, the, 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 the game would be set up a nice pricing scheme and then compare the blue er brown area to the blue area. Okay, so in the next two slides I'm going to probably do a mistake and try to show a proof and trying to be slightly more formal about what this slide says. If you get lost during the proof, it's not, it's not a big deal. You can recover by forgetting those slides. <laughs> okay. So I'm assuming sort of some fixed pricing scheme. Of course, later I'll have to give you a pricing scheme, but this would work for any pricing scheme. 
So what we'd like to do is sort of, what I like to do is to sum up those blue areas. Those blue areas, I'm sort of intuitive claiming this is what the optimum can get. And I'm summing out those brown areas. Those brown areas, what is our algorithm getting? And if we can sort of bound the area of the blue areas by some fun linear function of the brown area, so alpha is sort of the multiplicative constant and beta is an additive constant, then I'm claiming that I can translate it to a competitive ratio. Competitive ratio has two parts. One is beta, which is additive, and one which is alpha, which is the multiplicative. Right. And sometimes in, in this setting, it's going to be inherent that we need not only a multiplicative factor, but an additive factor. Because when we are setting up the first price, if you are setting it above cost, there might be sort of always someone comes in between. Okay. This is a minor issue. So here is the two slides proof. So a buyer comes and he sees a, a certain set of prices. And he decides to buy a bundle SB. And not the bundle that you should be given in the optimal allocation. So what we should really consider and is why did he choose this bundle? So, so this inequality is his incentive constraint, right? He prefers the bundle S over the bundle O, given the prices that we gave him. Right. This is why he chooses S. Now we can sort of sum up over all the buyers. So when we sum up all the, over all the buyers, let's see what we get. The first item is the sum of the values of all the buyers. The second item is the sum of the payments of all the buyers. So now if I add and subtract the cost, so the value of all the buyers minus the cost is the social welfare. I need I, to add the cost. And this is the payment that the algorithm got. On this side, I can do the same trick. This is the value that I, I get from the optimal location. I want to subtract from it the cost, so I need to add it here again. And this is sort of, so this is, a, this is like a strange payment because I'm not looking at the payment given some optimal payment mechanism. I'm looking at the payment of the, at the payment given that someone sort of would force the buyer to buy the optimal bundles rather than the, what they really like. This is this P. Okay. So the left hand side is very intuitive, right? Because if you think what is the price that the algorithm got minus its cost, this is its profit, right? So if I go here, if you look, if you can see this part, this is the difference between the price and cost. This is the profit. So now what we are left with is the difference between the prices the buyer would have paid for the optimal allocation and the cost they would have gotten here. This lambda should have been off, probably. Okay. So now we can, rather than sort of, so the prices that we are offering are changing over time. But just for the sake of the prices paid on the, on the burdens of op, let us increase those prices and set them basically at the final prices. So this is sort of the prices that the, the pricing scheme has when it finished f selling to all the buyers. So this would only increase this part. Okay, but now what do I have? What I claim now is that I have just the blue area because I'm really summing the differences between the final price of the J copy, which is sort of a straight line, versus the cost of production. Let me go to slide back. No, I'm going forward. Right. So this is sort of the price that I fixed, and this is sort of what I'm summing. Right? Right? So exactly this would be the blue area. Right? So given those two, I've shown what, what, what I would like to show. I related the social welfare that the online algorithm got to the social welfare that the optimal allocation gives, and really, the dependence is de it depends on the ratio between the blue area and this is sort of what the brown area would be. 
Okay. So now I have a general theorem that really says, okay, given a pricing scheme, if you can show some property of it, you can show how well it does. So let's look at it, it is one simple pricing scheme, which is price at twice the index. It means that for every item J, when you have the case, when you want to sell the case copy, look at the two case copy, how much does it cost to produce it, and give it at that price. Okay, so first of all, know that the prices are always above cost because we are assuming that costs are going up. And now basically what we'll need to do is sort of compare this blue and brown area. So visually it would look like this. This is like a linear cost function. Pricing it twice the index, it's a, li a different linear function, right? It's basically, it's, it's taking here the derivative and multiplying it by two. And now when I finish selling at this point, I need to compare this brown area to potentially what I could have sold, which is all this blue area. So if you look at this sort of as a two-dimensional picture, you have a triangle, two triangles, you should be able to compare them. You should know that it would come up to be a constant. And the constant would be sort of one-sixth or something like this. So, so basically given, so now for different schemes, you can see if I fix a scheme, so I fix the scheme of using twice the index, and now I fix sort of how is the cost changing, the cost is, when the cost is changing linearly, I can show a multiplicative bound of one six, and sort of an additive bound is sort of a difference between the price of the second item and the first item, because you see, I'm always pricing at the price of the second item at least, and if buyers would come in between, I'm not going to sell anything. If it's going to be polynomial, then the multiplicative bound would be sort of something like this. And, and if it's go going to be logarithmic, you're going to get a constant competitive ratio. Okay. Okay, so, so this is a very simple algorithm, and it does work in many cases, linear cost, polynomial cost, logarithmic cost, in all those cases, it does give you something which is sort of constant, competitive ratio. So let's see well, when does it fail. It really fails in, the, in a very simple case of limited supply. So in a limited supply, right, we have K items, and you can think of the cost up to here as being constant, and this is sort of dotted line is infinite. It's how, it's how to, to, to draw an infinite line on two-dimensional screen, but to, how, how am I going to now to price it? So, so the f if this is k, the first k over two item I'm going to price at cost, right? The next k over two items I'm going to, to, to price at infinity. Doesn't make much sense, and it's clear it's going to be very poor social welfare because the first k over two item I'm just going to get almost nothing for them, and the next k over two item, I'm never going to sell them. So, so unfortunately, this simple algorithm fails for this uh, simple uh, case, but it's not inherent. Like, we can get good algorithms that will be able to handle a limited supply. For example, the Bartal et al algorithm that I mentioned before is able to get a logarithmic uh, competitive ratio for this case. Okay. So the second algorithm that we have handles like an arbitrary convex function. So the convex function is going to be this red line going upward. And the idea is it's sort of fairly simple. What we are going to do is take an arbitrary convex function and discretize it. We are going to, to discretize it to levels. So really the pricing scheme is going to be fixed price for a certain amount, then going up a fixed price, going up a fixed price, going up a fixed price, etc. And what is sort of qualitatively the properties that I would like from this pricing scheme? So I'm going to have a multiple pri discrete prices. <coughs> I would like sort of at every price level to have enough prices, e enough items, sort of, like a logarithmic n number of items so that I sort of be able to sell, to think about this as a problem of selling many items at a fixed pr a price. I'd like to, I'd like 
at every price level to truly run a limited supply algorithm. Because now when I'm fixing sort of the cost, I can use a limited supply algorithm to tell me, okay, this is all the items that you get. Here is sort of infinite. And if I get here, then, then I move to another algorithm that will do this part. Okay. So, so I'd like every level to be long enough, and I'd like the jump between the level not to be too big. And we're going to see it the next slide one. And technically, I also would like, I need to assume sort of that I have some bound on the maximal utility of any user, sort of. Okay. So what we are able to show is that, <coughs> that using such a pricing scheme, you can get sort of a logarithmic competitive ratio. And the logarithmic is sort of the multiplicative logarithmic. And I'm not going to, to do the proof, but really I'm going to say that there are really two cases. If I'm going to sell many copies of one item, really but the fact that we have sort of the price jumps doesn't jump too much, the last complete level that we solved would sort of cover everything that we need. The other extreme would sort of, if we sell few out items, this is going to be the problematic case. And here is sort of, this would introduce the additive loss, and this is sort of where we also use the convexity. Now, the last uh, sort of thing algorithm that I want to talk about is the profit maximization one. So, the so, so really, it's sort of a reduction given two algorithms, one which is doing a social welfare maximization and one which is doing a profit maximization for a single buyer. And it outputs sort of a joint one algorithm using this combination. And this is sort of inspired similar somewhat to other book at all, which did it for, I think, a single item. So the algorithm has a, has a very simple logic. Either the social welfare algorithm gets a lot of profit, in which case we should be done easily. So half the time just use the pricing of the social welfare algorithm and you're almost done. Now it might be that the social welfare algorithm doesn't get any profit. For example, in the unlimited supply, to maximize the social welfare, you should price everything at, at cost. Then let's use the sum of the prices of the social welfare plus the single buyer. So this algorithm, is, the second algorithm is, is for a single buyer and to reset every, every time. But since the social welfare algorithm didn't have a lot, <coughs> a lot of profit, it means that it left a lot of surplus. If it left a lot of surplus, intuitively the second algorithm could bite into it. It's not a proof, but this is going, this is what you'll have to trust now. Okay, so let me sort of say a few concluding re remarks. So, so the main thing, amazingly enough, I'm going to be on time. <laughs> um, so, so we looked at the, at the changing cost of production. I think sort of, it's not surprising from the economics perspective literature, I think sort of, much of algorithm game theory had like two lines of research of digital good supply and, and limited supply. I think this is a sort of a very natural way to put things in between. And the interesting thing is that assuming natural sort of increasing cost, you do get improved bound compared, let's say, to the limited supply case. So, so we do get in many of the interesting cases a constant competitive bound, and, in, and even we get, I think both algorithms are fairly simple. The other one is sort of more complex, and therefore I didn't show it. And for future work, sort of, so we looked at the online setting, and in the online se setting, there's natural barriers that what you can do with the limited information that you do have about the buyer. But you can think about the same question in the offline setting, and maybe in that case, you can get better ratio. The other thing is that of, we talked about increasing prices. Increasing prices is the natural thing to, to think about. And uh, decreasing prices has also a very natural interpretation. It's much less understood. 
because if you think about the demand curve and the supply curve, you don't have a single point in which they intersect anymore, for example. We, we did start, we do have some initial result about the decreasing um, prices. And the last point is a more technical bound point is sort of, we are able to show for any convex increasing function, I do believe that we should be able to sort of generalize it to an arbitrary increasing function and sort of with probably a messier uh, expression. Okay, I'm done. All right, we have time for a